everybody. I'm Dr. Jane Greer, marriage and family therapist, sex therapist, host of the Doctor on Call Radio Hour at HealthyLife.net, and author of several books, including "What About Me?" "Stop Selfishness from Ruining Your Relationship," and "How Could You Do This to Me?" Learning to Trust After Betrayal. Welcome to Shrink Wrap, where we look at the things we can learn from the trials and triumphs of celebrity relationships. We talk with the people who work with them behind the scenes and the people whose lives they impact. Joining me today is one of my favorite folks, Dr. Jeffrey Gurian. Jeffrey is going to share his history, including his extensive work as a celebrity comedy writer, how he personally overcame adversity with humor, much like Norman Cousins, how that guided him to the serious business of becoming a dentist, a trained psychotherapist and author, all of which are avenues that promote healing, all with his work. Currently, he writes his own celebrity-based entertainment column called Comedy Matters, and his newest endeavor is the release of the third book in his happiness series, Facing Adversity, Stories of Courage and Inspiration. But wait, I have the celebrity authority here with me, the Mr. New York Post celebrity authority from today, hot off the press. Jeremy Piven has been trying his hand at stand-up comedy, did some killer impressions during a recent gig we hear. And who was there to comment and give his authority was comedy insider and journalist Jeffrey Gurian, where he said he went on wearing a motorcycle, a, a motorcycle jacket and added that Piven mixed acting with stand-up in a very endearing way. He went on to elaborate that Piven was known for his great, his great impressions and also his impression of Mark Wahlberg, Frank Gorian. With all that being said, we have got the celebrity New York Post country expert who has had his own trials and tribulations, has overcome them, has turned them into an experience that is meaningful, empowering, and so inspirational for each and every one of you out there listening. And I am delighted and thrilled to be talking with you, Dr. Jeffrey Gorian, again, once more with feeling. Welcome. Thank you so much. What a fantastic introduction. And can I just say, I hope you're accepting compliments because you look fantastic. I love your hair and I love the color blue. We're both wearing blue. The fifth you know, chakra. <laughs> well, first, let me say to you, Right. I'm always open to compliments. The door is wide open. That goes right to the heart. I am so appreciative. And I always have loved our synchronicity. We've got the same initials, JLG, right? We have both been devoted to healing and using humor and finding the funny in the serious. You know, mm -hmm. uh, years ago, a dear friend's brother had a, a brain tumor for many years. And he wrote a book called You Have to Keep Your Sense of Tumor in terms of being able to deal with it and, and, and really learn from it. But you have a remarkable history. I mean, remarkable. You and I were working at one point. I had the opportunity to come to join you in your home and absolutely be awed by the magnitude and scope of the work that you have done. And I must say, my friend, you are so humble and unassuming about how extensive and pervasive your reach is in terms of the world of comedy. That's before we're not even getting to comedy becoming the road into turning the unhappy into the happy. So just give us a couple of hits of some of the extraordinary people that you have had the opportunity and the um, talent to work for and write for. That was a great question. And, you know, I look at it as an honor, really, that I got to work with such legendary comedians. Uh, going back to the comedians from the golden age, and I date myself when I say this, but for people watching who would remember, I got to write for Milton Berle, who was my sponsor in the Friars Club, Mr. Television, Jerry Lewis, people like Henny Youngman. Uh, and, I, you know, I wrote for Rodney Dangerfield, Joan Rivers, Richard Belzer, Gilbert Gottfried, even up to the young stars of today, I worked with Nick Kroll and John Mulaney. They had me open their show for them on Broadway, their hit show, Oh Hello. And they made me a special jacket that was an exact replica 
of Curtis Lewis guardian angels jacket, but oh, my but my jacket says Gurian angels. I love it. I love it. But you know what, Jeffrey, you really have been an angel to so many people, your fortitude, your resilience, your stamina in terms of your own plight, the things that you've overcome, and then paving the way for so many other people. And those are architects of comedy that you were talking about. And the fact that you were paving the road for them at the beginning is really extraordinary. Tell us how you got from ha ha to help, helping people and helping people move through their trials and tribulations. Well, I was always doing both. Interestingly enough, when I was 12 years old, I must have been a really weird kid. I decided <laughs> I, want, I, I wanted to be a doctor and I was already writing comedy. And I knew that I was too sensitive to become an MD because my sensitivity overwhelmed me. At that young age, I didn't know that I was an empath. I just wondered why I felt things so deeply. Being an empath is a very difficult journey through life. It's great as a doctor because it makes you feel empathetic towards your patients. I had a patient once say to me, I think you'd rather hurt yourself than hurt me because wow. it, was very, it was very important to me to develop painless techniques of dentistry. I was a cosmetic specialist and then I was a professor at NYU, a clinical professor in oral medicine and oral facial pain. And my specialty became taking away headaches, just using my hands. I was there for 12 years and they saw, me, they saw me doing this in the clinic because of stress. Many people clench and grind their teeth. The formal name is bruxism and it causes a lot of problems that people are not aware of. Uh, more than in this country alone, more than 150 million people suffer with what they think are migraine headaches that are really musculoskeletal headaches that come from overuse of the jaw. And because of these last two years that we've all been living with such stress, many dentists have been seeing patients come in with cracked and broken teeth, and they don't realize that it's because they're grinding so hard and it causes these headaches. The muscles in the head, which control the jaw are in three areas. They're in the temple region, they're in the masseter region, they're in the occipital region behind your head where that little bump is down below your ears and even in the shoulders. So if people wake up in the morning and their neck hurts, the last person in the world they would think to tell would be their dentist, right? Why would you ever tell your dentist that your neck hurts, of course. Sure. right? So people, what people do is they use the information available to them to make up an excuse that makes sense to them. So if they wake up in the morning and their neck hurts, they tell themselves, oh, my pillow is no good. My mattress is no good. I slept in a funny position. I spent too long at the gym because you can't know what you don't know. You can't wake up in the morning with neck pain and say, you know what, my, uh, my, my trapezius muscles are sore. It must be my TMJ because, <laughs> you know, because that information is not in your hard drive. So you know? let me ask you, in, you were doing such extraordinary work, so visionary and really enabling people to get to the root of their pain. What made you move on from that into another endeavor? Well, I was doing comedy all along. While I was in practice, I was writing for Rodney and Joan Rivers and all these big stars. And my nurse had very strict instructions, never interrupt me with a patient unless it's for show business. So, <laughs> unless so, it's funny. Right. So she would come in and she'd be like, Dr. Rivers is on the phone, Dr. Lewis is calling. The only one, <laughs> the only one no one believed was Dr. Dangerfield. No one ever believed that there could be a Dr. Dangerfield. But, um, I did it for many, many years. And then I was doing a book with Chris Rock, of all people, because he's- Oh, for Chris, of all people. Yeah, and uh, I, I did a book on the history of the, uh, the comic strip, the legendary comedy club, where he oh, was yeah. covered by, Chris, uh, by Eddie Murphy in 1985, when Chris was just 19 years old. And I interviewed everybody, Seinfeld and uh, George Wallace and Lisa Lampanelli, and, uh, Billy Crystal, all the big stars that came out of that club. And that's when I kind of made the transition into comedy, uh, strictly into comedy. But I still lecture. I just lectured to the doctors at Temple University at the request of the dean, because people knew of my work, uh, uh, of uh, a very non-invasive way of taking away headaches. I believe that dentists should be treating headaches. Uh, yeah. Because to... 
too many of those cases go undiagnosed. Amazing. A lot of most physicians are not aware of the symptoms of TMJ. And unfortunately, a lot of dentists don't check people for that. They don't ask people, do you wake up with neck pain and shoulder pain and back pain? Uh, tinnitus, you know, some people say tinnitus, but ringing in the ears can also be caused by TMJ. Even eye pain, facial pain, there are so many That's different just, symptoms. That's just absolutely so, amazing. And you so, would never make the connection. Exactly. So I was treating those just with energy. And, you know, if you just walked into a university and said, well, I take away pain with my hands, they'll throw you out. They'll call the police. <laughs> they'll be like, this guy's a lunatic. You're the next guru, but, right? The next messiah here. But they saw me doing it for 12 years. So I got to lecture to the faculty at NYU. And then the head of the TMJ department had me do a treatment on him. Michael Gelb is his name. His father wrote the book on TMJ, Harold Gelb. And and then he had me lecture to his postgraduate students. And so I carry that message when I talk, when I have an opportunity, like on your show, I talk about that and I talk about how I cured myself of, of a severe stuttering problem. I stuttered through my twenties and beyond into my thirties. Even after I was a doctor, I was blocking on certain words. And I realized one day that I didn't stutter when I was alone. I only stuttered when I was trying to talk to somebody else. And I consider it grace. I was given the grace to realize that you can't have a disability based on your location, right? <laughs> if, a man, if a man has a limp, he limps in every room of his house. You can't go into a room and close the door and walk perfectly. But if I could speak better when I'm alone, then theoretically it means there's nothing wrong with me. You and had I'm, your own aha moment. Right, it was an aha moment. And I always, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the power of thought. You know, in 1999, I presented my work to the Association for Spirituality and Psychotherapy. And they were all classically trained psychotherapists, except for me. And they accepted my work on thought because it made sense to them. And they said, how do you know all this? You're saying everything that we know in different words. And I said, it just makes sense to me. And I've been working with people ever since. I've been on that board for 20 years. Uh, it was formed by Henry Grayson a doctor who, who founded the National Institute of the Psychotherapies. Yes, and absolutely. They gave me the validation to lecture at energy psychology conferences on the power of thought, on how you can literally change your mind, which led to my first book on happiness, which is called Healing Your Heart by Changing Your Mind, a spiritual, a spiritual and humorous approach to achieving happiness. And it became a bestseller on Amazon. And you have a dog. You know how hard it is to get a dog to sit in no <laughs> position like that? You know, it's, a, it's almost impossible. Listen, Floating on an orange pillow. Yes. You, are, you are absolutely a master of energy and energetic healing. And you use energy. You use healing energy in mind, body, thought, in moving it through the body. Laughter, creating the ability for people to laugh is moving their energy and it becomes yeah. healing. So if anybody can get a dog to be still and <laughs> in boot up position, it's you. I mean, that that is truly incredible. And you know what, Jeffrey? You integrated remarkably over the course of time everything that you do. You integrated the healing, the energy, the laughter, the dental work, the, you know, the, the inspirational work into what is everybody's ultimate goal happiness. So tell us about your happiness series. Yeah, as I said, I've always been fascinated by people that overcome obstacles. In you know, in my own life, I overcame things that are nothing compared to what's in my newest book about facing adversity. But I overcame stuttering and I was able to survive a, a widow maker heart attack uh, oh by thinking God. positive. I was back on stage five days later. And the owner of the club said to me, what are you crazy? You just had a serious heart attack. And I was like, yeah, but it's hard to get a spot here. I don't want to lose my spot. <laughs> <laughs> only, only another comedian would know how sick that is. But when I, when I left the hospital, you know, and I, you know, you had mentioned a body mind approach, but I use a body mind spirit approach. There's a very heavy spiritual aspect to what I do. 
which is very different than religion. I'll just say very quickly, religion can be wonderful for people, but it tends to divide us because it puts you into a category and other people are automatically outside that category if they're not part of that religion. And spiritual, well, spirituality brings us together because all it asks is that you believe in a power greater than yourself. Yeah. And when you're, when you're in a, uh, and, and because if you think that you're running everything in your life, you tend to blame yourself when things don't go the way you would like them to. I don't even want to say when things go wrong, but when things don't go the way you would like them to, you tend to think, oh, I should have done this. I could have said that. And you're blaming yourself. And that's one of the causes of emotional illness. People who are depressed very often are living in the past and they're worrying about the future and they're losing the now. Mm -hmm. So when I was on the operating table and they were unplugging my heart, I was still partially awake and I was joking with the surgeon. I remember saying to him, because I, I felt what they were doing. And I said to him, I feel you in my heart, not in a romantic way, but I feel you in my heart. <laughs> and he said, I'll give you more anesthetic. And that's the last thing I remember until he came to my room and he hugged me and he said to me, I want you to know you're a miracle. And I said, no, you're the miracle. You're the guy who saved me. And you know what? You felt him in your heart, literally. And in your own words, that was the spiritual transition. He was working with your heart physically, but he was healing your heart as well. Exactly. Emotionally and spiritually. And, you know, you said it right there. And there was that connection and bond. The first time I met Mehmet Oz, he had just done surgery on my mom. He did heart surgery on her. And he used to hold the heart in his hands and talk to it. Every part of your body has its own consciousness. Mm. You know? And if he wasn't such an eminent surgeon, again, people might have thought he was nuts to say that. I mm. hold your heart and I speak to it. But mm. every part of your body responds. When you, Every part of your body is like a, a little child. The same way that you would embrace a child if they were scared, you'd hug them to make them feel safe. It's the same thing with your body. Before you do anything, you always hold to make the person feel safe. And so I had to do it when I was in the hospital with COVID double pneumonia. You know, Amazing. I'm a trendsetter. I got it when it first came out. I don't want to wait. I want to watch, watch 2020. I got it immediately. And uh, Why wait? <laughs> you know. when the ambulance took me to the hospital, the ambulance guys came to my house in hazmat suits. And one of them took my hand and he said to me, don't worry, you're going to be okay. And I have to tell you, that simple act of kindness was so powerful. And I like to stress that also, that you never know what, you know, what seems so simple to you can be so powerful to somebody else. I was so sick and he said he was amazed that I could get on the stretcher myself because most people they had to carry and put them on the stretcher. And I really think that my positive thinking helped me to get through that. Because when I got to the emergency room, they put me in a cubicle next to a woman who was screaming, literally screaming with every breath that she took. And the tendency is to start to think, why me? Why does this happen to me? And I have to be here. The spiritual answer is, why not me? Whoever promised me that my life is supposed to be perfect and nothing was supposed to happen. So I had to step outside myself. And instead of thinking about how, how I felt, Think about how scared this woman must be or how much pain she must be in to be screaming. And it takes a lot of work to do that, to get yes, outside absolutely. of your head and to, and to think of someone else besides yourself. They were almost going to send me home until they x-rayed my lungs and they said, you have COVID double pneumonia. We're going to find a room for you. And they put me in isolation for a couple of days and they were able to save me you know, and I had to fight very hard to stay positive because one thing I want to say is that when you're in a negative space, your immune system doesn't function as well. Correct. When Correct. you're in a positive space, you know, I was actually making jokes and I was thinking of funny things and I was recording things and they announced on Sirius XM, Ron Bennington, who was like an angel to me. I used to be a regular on Sirius XM for a couple of years. It's a huge comedy show. And he announced on the radio that I was in the hospital. And I started getting messages, hundreds of messages from people, big stars also, but also regular people. And I was too sick to answer anybody, but I'm a very big believer in the power of prayer and the power of thought. When so many people are focusing their energy on something, I really think it has an effect. Definitely. And 
uh, you know, it really helped me to recover. And I said afterwards, it's a shame that you have to be so sick to know that people care about you. But, well, but that's, <laughs> you know what, Jeffrey, that's part of the journey. Sometimes people don't know how loved or beloved they are or how cared about they are. And their illness is what becomes the reach where people reach out and touch them mm -hmm. and help them feel really the caring and the support that makes you a stronger, healthier person. You know, a very my very dear friend is a celebrity uh, spiritualist psychic, Maria Papa Petros, and she talks about literally the words we use and how important they are. That when you say, oh, you're cracking me up or you're killing it, she would say, do you want cracks in your face? Do you want to die? And I remember saying to her, but, but you know, it, you're cracking me up. She said, no, she said, what am I doing? I said, well, it's really funny. She said, well, say that. It's really funny. And the power of the words we use, that's the core of hypnosis. When we take the things that scare yeah. us, frighten us, that's mental illness. All our fears, all our anxieties, all those negatives, mental illness, turn it into the positive. And when you say it literally exactly what you are talking about, it goes from a conscious level to the unconscious level and into and the body on a cellular level. You discovered that not only did you, un you know, come across that and discover it at an early age, but you used it to empower yourself and empower so many other people. Really, really a gift, truly a gift. So Thank you so much for understanding that because, you know, it's what I did. I had to convince my subconscious mind that I no longer needed to stutter because it was my subconscious mind that created that need for me in the first place when I was about seven years old. And while I was recovering, I wrote the second and third books in my happiness series. The second one was called Fight the Fear. I Over love it. Overcoming <laughs> obstacles that stand in your way because fear is a bully and it wants you to stay in bed with the covers over your head. And I refuse to do that. I confront my uncomfortability on a daily basis because I grew up fighting fear. And in 2019, just before the pandemic, I challenged myself. I went to Japan all by myself for two weeks. It was oh the scariest goodness. thing. It was the scariest thing I can think of to do. I, some for some reason, I've always been fascinated with Japanese culture. And for two years in a row, a friend who was supposed to go with me canceled out. And I said, you know what? I can't depend on people anymore. I have to do this myself. And I have fears of traveling because my ADHD gets me very confused. So I'm always lost. And I went and I conquered the Japanese subway system, which they admit is the most difficult in the world. Oh I went goodness. on the subway every day. I went from Tokyo to Kyoto to Osaka. I performed in two comedy shows while I was over there. I went to spiritual meetings. I, I, I survived two weeks and I used the little Japanese that I had learned and I made it through through all kinds of stuff. But you did more than survive, you thrived. It really became, it pushed you onto another realm and into another dimension of health and healing. Incredible. Absolutely, it was a challenge to myself. And then, you know, I was in the house for months recovering and that's when I decided I had to write this third book on happiness called Facing Adversity, Stories of Courage and Inspiration. Because I've always been fascinated by people who overcame obstacles. I believe that we're given obstacles in our lives to become inspirations to other people. If you can overcome them, some people are overwhelmed by their obstacles and some courageous people take that and they rise above it somehow. So 20 years ago, I started collecting these articles. I cut out things from newspapers and magazines of, uh, of stories from people all over the world. And I put them in a folder and I have a closet filled with folders of articles on different subjects. And while I was recovering, I said, you know, people have been through so much in the last two years. They need hope and they need inspiration because so many people have lost hope because we've never had to go through something like this pandemic before, a hundred years ago. I don't know what those poor people did then, but I wanted to write something that would help people. So I compiled these stories into a book and they amaze me. They absolutely amaze me. I'll, I'll give you a couple of quick examples. A little three-year-old boy in Korea was playing hide and seek and he hides behind a tractor and the tractor's running and he puts his hands in and it cuts off his hands. Not only just cut off his hands as if that's not bad enough, it cut the thumb off of one of his hands. His, oh. father, his father is a surgeon 
who sees okay. it happen. His mother's a nurse. They rush him to a hospital, but it's a holiday and there's no surgeons available that do that kind of surgery. The father has never done it before, but he assembles a team of people and he operates for nine hours and he reattaches his son's hands. They put them in casts and the hands don't function. They're alive, but they don't function. The grandfather is a martial arts master and he starts training this little boy every day in Taekwondo for hours every day. And that little boy grew up to be a famous spinal surgeon. Who ah. runs, he, runs, he runs the spinal surgery department at a hospital in Colorado. He came to this country as a teenager, went to medical school. His first impulse was to become a hand surgeon because he was so grateful. And he became a black belt in martial arts and runs the spinal surgery. You know how, what kind of dexterity you need to be a spinal surgeon? It's my, Jeffrey, it's mind boggling. But you mind know what you're yeah. describing, do you remember the old original rescue show, Rescue 911? It was on like about 20 years ago. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly what you're describing, exactly what you, did, what you captured in your book. It would be these crises that people would have. But what was so incredible about it was who was there in striking distance to save that person? Like just the other day, they had on the news a woman who had uh, uh, her heart stopped and she was on a plane with cardiologists going to a, a heart meeting who were there to help her and save her. The remarkable uncanny timing of people being brought together. Yes, that to fascinating. Help and to heal is, it's, it's fascinating, absolutely. That kind of synchronicity is fascinating to me that me the universe too. the universe puts people in your life that are supposed yes. to be there yes you know? and it's it's happened to me many times i have what i call god stories but i'll tell you one last story because this was not you know from this book facing adversity stories of courage and inspiration uh, a little boy was born without arms and legs in australia no limbs at all and the bullying was so horrible because children are very cruel sometimes and at 10 years old, he tried to commit suicide because he thought there was no hope for him. And But then he changed his mind. He was going to sink under the water in the tub. But then he realized how sad it would make his parents. And he went on. He grew up to be a worldwide motivational speaker. And his greatest fear was that he'd have to live his life alone because he said, who would want to be with someone with no limbs? He's married to a beautiful woman and has four children. This beautiful woman saw him speaking at a conference because he also writes books. And she was so drawn to him. And those people are amazing to me too, people that don't judge you. She's drawn to a man with no limbs. And I saw pictures of them. They're amazing. I saw him on Oprah not too long ago. And he's married to her and has four beautiful children. Those are the kind of stories that inspire people because Sometimes we tend to feel sorry for ourselves and we wish that things would be different. And self-pity is one of the worst things that you can experience. It's very draining. It's, it's, it's not right. I believe in, in creating a gratitude list and being very aware of all the things that you have to be grateful for. And that's why I wrote this book. And so far it's got all five star reviews. I call it, it's the third in my happiness series. Well, people are not only grateful for your book, but we are grateful that you wrote it. Let me ask you, before we have to stop for today, you know, we all talk about the lessons that we learn, that illness is there to help us move on our journey, to bring new things, new happenings into our life. What do you think your takeaway lesson was from the COVID, the double pneumonia, the, the heart attack? What was your takeaway from that? Because you were already so inspirational and so motivated. How did you find the courage within to, to carry on at that point? And what was your takeaway? You know, there's no alternative. You can either let things get you down to the point where you feel crushed. And, you know, look, I, I'm, to be very honest, I, I'm human. I have days that are off days. I'm not happy every single day, but I remind myself all the time. I have a very strong spiritual connection. And I ask for guidance every day uh, to accept what God's will is for me. I use, you know, you can call it nature, the universe, God, whatever feels comfortable to you. But I ask for guidance. 
And I realize that whatever I'm going through is my path. You can't only believe in those principles when it feels like your life is perfect. It's when it feels like nothing is going right, that that's when those principles are very I'm important. Alive. Absolutely. Yeah. You either believe or you don't believe. So my takeaway is that I'm meant to be here, that hopefully I can help more people with different things. I've been given my own obstacles. Um, you know, I went through divorce and the, uh, depression and things and just things that people do go through in life. No life struggles. The life struggles. Of, of, right, exactly. Of but I've, I've were managed. They, were you hopeless at any point in any of those you know, situation. Oh, only the night before I went to the hospital with COVID, I was, I was wondering if I could make it through that night. I had waited two weeks to call an ambulance because um, they were warning people stay out of the emergency rooms, especially if you have a heart condition. So I was afraid. I was afraid to go, but my symptoms were so severe that I knew I didn't want to call it in the middle of the night. That was too scary. I said if I can wait, if I can survive until the morning but I actually felt suicidal and I don't say that lightly and I have so much to live for, but I was on my terrace thinking about how I could end this because I couldn't take the pain anymore. I had wow. so many symptoms. I was nauseous from morning to night and my fever was out of control. Wow. My, first day, my first day in the hospital, they just covered me in ice to bring down my fever and they wanted to raise my blood pressure. Normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. My 80 had dropped to 42. So my circulatory system was collapsing. Good and that job. was their concern. And on the second day, they started me on hydroxychloroquine and zinc. And that turned the corner for me. But, you know, I had to, I had to really fight to stay positive, Jane. Incredible. And, uh, well, you had so it. much, you had so much practice, Jeffrey. You had so much, you had done so much due diligence in your life, it's almost like your whole life before was your dress rehearsal for the main event. Like yeah, that was I, getting oh. you ready so that you could go the distance and really put everything that you knew, all the principles into practice so that you could continue to live and survive something so atrocious. And, mm -hmm. and that sadly has taken the lives of so many people, so many people who could not do what you did, who did not have the tools and the resilience and all that, you know, stamina and, and uh, ability. Well, Incredible. You know what? It was also grace. And when the ambulance guys took me home, they came into my apartment and they saw all the pictures of the comedians. They stayed <laughs> for about 20 minutes asking for the questions until I finally had to say, guys, I'm a little tired. I got to go to bed. <laughs> you know what? I, I honestly think you could make a good living if you just charged a couple of bucks for people to tour your apartment and see all the celebrities that you have written jokes for with the signatures and the one the, the outpouring of love and gratitude that they have for you. Well, Jeffrey, I have to say, I have such gratitude for you coming on, sharing your stories, your history, your expertise, your wisdom, your spirituality, your talent, and the gift of healing that you do on so many multiple levels. And I'm just so pleased to have had you here. ComedyMattersTV.com is where you can visit Jeffrey online. You can find his series of books, The Happiness Series, on Amazon.com. And you can learn more from me, Dr. Jane Greer, at www.drjanegreer.com or on Facebook and Instagram. You can check out more showtimes and updates. Thank you everybody for joining us for this episode of Shrink Wrap. Jane, thank you so much for having me on. If you don't mind, I just want to give my stuttering website. It's oh, stop, stop stuttering now, gurian.com. G-U-R-I-A-N. Stop stuttering now, gurian.com. And it's always a pleasure to be on with you, Jane. I always look forward to our talks. We have this real synchronicity, JLG. <laughs> the and, and courage. Your, your book is courage. My book is uh, courage to change. You know, we both, we, we come at the same goal and objective. Clear yes. the obstacles, help people overcome the adversity, help them find their own happiness within, help them minimize and get through their anxieties, their fears, so that they don't hold them back and disrupt and spoil their pleasure mm -hmm. and doing all the tools in our toolkits to give them to people. And of course, finding the funny in it all. You know, if you yeah. can't laugh your way through it, 
Forget that. <laughs> exactly. Putting positive so, energy out to the universe. That's the, you said that's it. Well, you'll come back and join us again. Thank you so Thank much. You thank you for having me. Have a wonderful Absolutely. day.